Hello and welcome to PCB Chat. I'm your host, Mike Buteau. The sponsor of today's podcast, PCB West, the leading trade show for the printed circuit industry, coming September 9th to 12th to the Santa Clara Convention Center. Visit PCBWest.com for details. My guest today is Jack Herring. Jack is the inventor of Soluboard, a new circuit board substrate that purports to be completely recyclable. He is commercializing the concept through his UK-based company, Jiva. Jack, welcome to PCB Chat. Thanks, Mike. I'm guessing most of our listeners aren't familiar with Soluboard, at least not yet. Let's talk about what it is and what it is not. My understanding is that, unlike typical epoxy glass substrates, it dissolves in hot water. The concept of Soluboard stemmed from a project a brief which was given to me by my tutors at college, um, and that was to uh, choose a waste stream to try and optimize and reduce the impacts um, on the planet if possible. So um, naturally, I made it quite hard for myself, and I chose um, e-waste or electronic waste, which is the fastest growing waste stream in the world. We're expecting about 50 million tons of it to be generated this year alone, I think. And a lot of work has been done in product design and industrial design to try and rethink how, how, how products are taken apart and how they're assembled. But I decided to go uh, one step further and to look into individual components or parts of these products um, and how they're made. Um, and one, one common part of all of these products is, is the PCB or the, the printed circuit board. So at this point in time, FR4, which is the, the market leading material, the, the most widely used material, is, is made out of epoxy resin and glass fibers and um, it's it's very difficult to recycle. Currently they shred the whole board down and it end up incinerating away the, the waste um, substrate material uh, in order to extract the, the precious metals uh, that are within the PCB. So not only is this uh, very expensive, um, you're also losing a lot of very precious uh, materials and metals and in, in, in that process. So uh, solid board, the vein might suggest this, but it's, it's designed to be water soluble. So um, at the end of a product's life, you can remove the the PCB, immerse it in um, hot water uh, just below the boiling point. Um, and this allows you to basically remove the precious metals and the components with the high value uh, materials inside of them um, in a much more clean method. Um, and about this allows you to avoid all of the, the burning and the, the production of the, the toxins which could end up in the environment. But it was, it was mainly uh, inspired by some uh, a very interesting uh, piece of work that I saw where we highlighted um, some some electronics uh, which were ending up in developing countries, particularly in in North um, Africa. Akboloshi in in Ghana is one of the biggest e-waste dumps in the world, and you see a lot of young young men um, making a living by recovering these PCBs and uh, cables and and such, uh, and burning them to extract these these precious metals and selling them back to these electronics manufacturers indirectly on, on the um, the black market, if you will. So uh, it's becoming a much bigger problem because China recently stopped taking back their electronic waste as well. So we're at a stage where we uh, need to consider how we're going to be recycling these products because I'm guilty of it as well. Everyone is starting to uh, sort of adopt this very disposable lifestyle. Products are being built uh, to, to, to last um, not as long as they used to. So... Um, we need to start considering how these products are made. You know, you really get to the heart of the matter, I believe, with the amount of waste that is being generated each year. And while your characterization of Africa, specifically Ghana and, and China, is absolutely correct, uh, my wife might disagree just in looking around my office and all the contents that are sitting here because I have tons of, of old boards that I uh, take apart the product and take pictures of and things like that. But that aside, can you discuss the constituents of the board? I mean, how did you put this together? I basically looked for, I looked at um, the individual materials which are used to make PCB laminates, and that basically comes down to a resin or a binder, some sort of fibers, and then a flame retardant, which is what the, the FR in FR4 stands for. So um, it's actually quite a basic material. It's just three ingredients. So I started looking at alternatives uh, for those sort of uh, materials. And um, flax is what our material is made out of. So it's 
fully biodegradable, uh, made out of uh, natural fibres, and it's um, it's got very uh, good mechanical properties. It's widely used through a number of um, industries, particularly within the automotive sector. Within Europe, I'm not sure if it's the same uh, in the US, but uh, a lot of automotive manufacturers have certain quotas that they have to meet by in terms of weight, uh, in terms of how much natural fibres they have to have within their vehicles. So um, your parcel shells and your structures within your door frames are now made out of flax at this point in time. So it's, it's actually quite hum- came from quite humble beginnings. Uh, my I had a, a, a job um, on the weekends while I was studying uh, to get some extra, extra cash in, as you do when you're a student. And um, I, I was actually involved in the mechanical um, embroidery um, industry. And one of the materials that they used uh, to, to prevent um, thread or uh, sinking into um, materials too deep is, is um, a starch-based material, which you can basically run under room temperature water and it allows you to, to, to dissolve it away. So um, I thought maybe we could turn this into a water-based uh, solution as a direct replacement for this um, epoxy resin. And so it's the, the fibres are basically impregnated with this resin. We had, we had to add some flame retardant in there as well because we're using natural fibres, so they are naturally slightly more flammable compared to the, the glass fibre alternative. But um, we've, a, we've been able to reach a point now where we can match the the UL um, specifications for FR4 in terms of flame retardancy. So that's one of the first big hurdles that we had to get over. So it's basically just a, a standard like-for-like like replacement in terms of the properties for each of these ingredients, um, just sourced from much, much more environmentally friendly sources, really. So flax, that's fascinating. I, I guess that explains why I have to dry clean my linen shirts. I can't just throw them in the wash with everything else. <laughs> So do you have experience with conventional bareboard fabrication? No, I don't. Uh, I'm, I've actually just been um, based in education up until um, the formation of, uh, of GEVA a couple of years ago. I was sort of sponsored by the Royal College of Art to file for a, a, uni- a patent within the UK. And that's we're actually now at a point where far we're uh, progressing with our PCT application, so we have patents pending internationally at this point, and uh, that basically allowed me to pitch in front of some uh, early stage investors the idea of Solid Board, and that was a couple of years ago now, and we're, we're, we've recently um, we're in the process of closing an investment round at this point in time with quite a large total. Uh, we've also been successful with a grant application within the UK as well, so. Um, this is all to continue our research and development process, but we're hoping that we're not too far away from getting a product which we can start rolling out into into industries. Uh, we're, we're actually f- uh, focusing on white goods and domestic appliances to start with. So it's been a process uh, where I've had to sort of learn these uh, processes, processes of fabrication for, for PCBs as I um, have been starting the company as well so as i say i'm a designer at heart and it's been full-on education up until the 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 point where the company has started but i've definitely learned a lot over the past couple of years and i've I've brought been able to bring some very useful skill sets on board with um, a number of experts within the industry to help us uh, get to the point where we are now you have a partner with quite a bit of technology experience correct yeah so I work quite closely uh, with Jonathan Swanston, who is um, he's a biochemist. Uh, he's he's got 35 years of techno commercial experience, and he's been um, heavily involved in the sale and the production of of a lot of uh, material science based products. So he's been great in terms of helping the development of Solibord. It looks like you're part of some type of a technology accelerator or incubator. Yeah, that's right. Um, I'm, I'm based in the uh, Royal College of Arts incubator in London. Um, and the reason I'm based there is because that's where I studied uh, my master's. I studied for, for a couple of years uh, for my uh, product design uh, master's, so I am a, a designer at heart. What is the fabrication process like? Is it similar at all to conventional bareboard fabrication? That's interesting. That's actually what our, our grant within the UK is, is focusing on 
Um, it's to, to ensure that we're able to integrate it as seamlessly into the existing um, manufacturing processes as possible. But one alternative we're looking at is um, the application of the circuitry to, to the substrate. And we're seeing a, a big increase in the use of, of silver conductive printing. This is primarily used in, in flexible uh, circuitry at this point in time, but um, it's, it's an additive process as opposed to the subtractive process of copper etching, which is uh, most widely used. So um, it's actually quite, it's a big annoyance for um, a lot of our potential customers who we've spoken to who have to pay for this, this waste uh, copper content, which is basically um, housed within the, the waste um, acid, which is used to etch the PCBs. And, this is a cost which affects their their profit margin. So um, if we're able to look at the way that we can apply a circuitry to, to the material in a much cleaner way, then that's maybe a longer term project for us. But as I say, we're trying to make sure that the circuitry application is that the material is as seamlessly integrated into that supply chain as possible. But yeah, the, the actual material itself is is made in a very similar way to, to, to the laminates. Uh, which are widely used without uh, throughout the industry. So, yeah, not too different at all, really. So it sounds like you could make multi-layers. Have you investigated how many layers you could stack up at a time? We're definitely looking into that. Uh, to start with, we're looking at single and double-sided boards um, primarily. We don't want to jump the gun, if you will. Second boards have been around since the 50s, and they've only really just got to the point where they're able to make these uh, very uh, precise and, and, and uh, circuit boards with multi layers. So within the white goods and domestic appliances that we're trying to uh, get some integration into, it, it is primarily a single and double sided board. So and that works for us at this point in time. But it's definitely something we, we, we were interested in doing. Um, it's definitely something that is viable because we are uh, laminating the material uh, compressed together under heat and pressure. Um, much like uh, how the existing market leader is as well. So, You did mention it's an additive process. Yeah. So are any special equipment or materials needed outside of, you know, obviously the soluboard organic substrate itself? Uh, would you need like a closed loop aqueous system, for example, uh, you know, to, uh, to dissolve the constituent materials? In terms of the, the end of life of the product, um, that's the recycling process is something which, uh, would have to be a unique um, development, uh, probably. But it's it's uh, what I like to imagine is is a, a big drum of hot water where these uh, circuit walls can be in the in in their hundreds or, or thousands, and with some uh, heat and some agitation, this allows you to then extract these components uh, with magnets and eddy currents and existing processes. So uh, that's something which we would look at long term but at this point in time we're just trying to make sure that we are able to uh, match the, the, the specifications for the market leading materials out there in terms of the actual uh, use of the product has anyone beta tested soluboard yet so we recently um, reached a, a proof of concept basically just uh, confirming that we're able to make circuitry on, on the material so that, that's, that was the first uh, big hurdle that we tried to reach and I mentioned previously that we're in the process of closing an investment round and um, that's with a, a relatively large manufacturer of domestic appliances so uh, Wi-Fi routers and satellite television boxes which of course house PCBs and um, there's a few uh, designs which we are being uh, presented with by some potential customers which we are looking to, to manufacture some advanced beta, beta prototypes so, based on, on the IP of a number of uh, different customers out there. So we, we need to get a bit further on the, the TRL um, process, the technology readiness scale, before it could be rolled out in a, in a number of different products. But we, we have a few people lined up. Um, I can't really say too much uh, because of confidentiality, obviously, but um, a lot of interest has been shown in the product uh, just by going to the, the trade shows and just some basic marketing online really can you talk for a minute or two about the electrical testing or other types of materials characterization uh, studies that you've done to this point yeah so up, up until this point we've been focusing on the uh, mechanical and electrical properties which have been provided to us by one of our potential customers we have a few highlighted which primarily consisted of flame retardancy which we've been able to tick off 
Um, another one is moisture absorption because our material is uh, designed to be water soluble. That's something which we, we need to consider. But we're quite fortunate with the, the polymer that we're using to, to make our solution, which we impregnate the fibers with, is, is very tunable. Um, it's very similar to pouches which um, and pods which we used in, in our dishwashers now. That's been tuned to be soluble at a much lower temperature because we are starting to, to wash things at a lower temperature um, to, to benefit the environment. But we do have a few tests such as comparative uh, tracking index. That's another, another one that's uh, very important for us. And as I say, we're, we're gradually working towards ticking off each of these tests one by one. Yeah, it's promising up until this point. Now, you mentioned that your primary initial market is the white goods market. Are there end-use restrictions that you've established at this point, other than perhaps just not using it in the shower? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, obviously, it'd be interesting to see how our material behaves in, in more humid parts of the world. I mean, with, with within a lot of goods, uh, there is enclosed compartments where circuit boards aren't intended we're actually at the, at the benefit of, of having to consider that circuit boards and many electronics aren't designed to get particularly close to, to water in, in the first place. So um, it's not anything which has to be um, <laughs> it's not anything which um, has to be sort of tailored in the manufacturing process um, too too carefully. But uh, tell that to my to both of my kids who've uh, each dropped their cell phones into a pool or in one case a toilet. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, we're seeing it. Yeah, we're seeing increase in in sort of nano nano coating technologies, which allow you to drop the the smaller, higher end products within within water for small amounts of time now anyway. So, um, and that that prevents the water from actually getting into any of the device devices uh, anyway. So, um, but as I say, if, if you're at a point where you've dropped your your phone in 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 in, the, in this ink or the water or, or the toilet, then uh, that's probably the least of your worries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Excellent point. Jack, what's the timeline for bringing Soluboard to market? I'm sure that uh, that's probably something your investors are constantly peppering you with. Yeah, um, so we're, we're going to be continuing the, the R&D process alongside the commercialization process, but we would like um, sort of our, our, our minimum viable product to be ready to go uh, within the next uh, nine months maybe so maybe the next the middle of 2020 is when we'll start to uh, be shipping it to to some some potential customers who have shown interest and what do you estimate the cost difference will be compared with fr4 once soluboard scales to production levels we'll be selling it for the exact same price uh, per square meter as fr4 so we're aware that um, a lot of Customers are very keen on having the added benefits of a green material, but they're, they're not always ready to pay a premium for it. So we're trying to make sure that we are at the same level to start with. And maybe once we can prove that there are savings throughout their supply chain and within the, the circular economy of these products, then that could be an added benefit to them as well. So, um, as I did mention previously, but the reason we're targeting white goods and domestic appliances is that um, white goods in particular, they are quite well regulated in terms of how they're collected and taken back within uh, Europe in particular. So it would allow us to as the recycling process of our, our solid water um, PCBs. So within fridges, for example, you have quite harmful gases within compressors. So there are standard um, dismantling processes that a lot of these products go through. And at that point in time, our, our PCB could be removed at that same step in the process. Now, there's several billion square meters of PCBs built every year, and that's a lot of material. Yeah. If Soluboard were to take off, how will you keep up with that demand? Um, so to start with, we'll be looking at a business-to-business -business, uh, sort of model where we'll be licensing the material. We're trying to make sure that it can be produced on any sort of laminate production line. And we are also not limited to purely flax fibers. There's also a number of other fibers out there, like uh, jute and hemp, and a lot of a lot of uh, natural fibers which have similar properties to flax. So these plants, the the actual crops are grown in there. 
in their thousands, hundreds of thousands of tons every year. So we definitely have the capacity there for our raw material supply. But as I say, the licensing model would allow us to to compete with uh, the FR4 to start with. As I say, only about 16% of that is sort of the, the target that we're um, looking at competing with because that's that's the instrumentation sector of light goods and domestic appliances. So I think it's something like 18 billion square meters of PCBs are manufactured every year. So it's an incredibly huge market. And we're not trying to say that we're going to be competing with um, every version of every substrate out there within every uh, product out there. But that's why we're keeping it quite niche to start with, with white goods and domestic appliances. But um, of course, in the future, we, we don't really know how quickly it could be adopted. Revolutions in the PCB industry are rare indeed, but yep. <laughs> uh, this has some promise, I think. The timing is excellent. The world has never paid more attention to the perils of uh, environmental waste, even if we haven't quite wrapped our uh, hands around the, the solution yet. So I, I wish you all the luck in the world, Jack. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's um, a time, difficult time politically and <laughs> um, also um, just in terms of sustainability as well. We'll, we definitely need to consider where we're going to be in a few years. But um, yeah, hopefully Solivord could be that key um, part in the supply chain where we can reassess how how electronics and electronic waste um, is handled as well. And that brings us to the end of today's PCB chat. I want to thank our guest, Jack Herring of Jiva. Jack, how do you suggest folks reach out for more information? So we have Twitter. Our Twitter is uh, Jiva Materials. And we also have a website, which is jivamaterials.com. And I'm also based within uh, the Royal College of Art in London. So if anyone ever finds themselves in in the capital, then um, I'd be happy to meet with them. And that's Jiva, J-I-V-A. Yep, J-I-V-A, and then materials. I want to thank the sponsor of today's podcast, PCB West, the leading trade show for the printed circuit industry, coming September 9th to 12th to the Santa Clara Convention Center. Visit PCBWest.com for details. This has been Mike Buteau for PCB Chat. Have a nice day. (laughs) 